I'd like to say how it has been a great blessing to my own soul uh, to be ministering to you here at this time. I'm a great believer in reading in the book of Providence. I don't think God's people read enough in the book of Providence. Someone asked me at the door of the church the other night, what do I mean by the book of Providence? And I said, that is the book that we clearly see God writing as he directs us in our ways. And we discover that what he says in his word is absolutely fulfilled, that all things work together for good to them that love God. I have a busy schedule uh, being a member of two parliaments, the moderator of the Free Presbyterian Church, the president of the Whitfield College of the Bible, the leader of the Ulster Democratic Unionist Party, among a few things I do. And other things I don't mention, they are only asides. But this I will say, it would have been impossible for me to think that I would have had such a long time in Greenville. I usually come to Bible Conference in the university each year, and when I come, I just get in and out, I do the services, and have to flee away. I didn't know that at this time, my dear friend and brother in Christ, Dr. Bob Jones, would have been ill. I would have loved, if I had known that, to know that I could spend some time with him. But Lord, the Lord ordered that for us. I was appointed his unofficial chaplain, and every day I have had the great privilege of being with him. He's a very dear and near friend to me, and I to him. We have been in many tough places in the battle for truth and righteousness together. He's one of the great men of this generation, and when he goes, he will be irreplaceable in the fundamentalist cause. And we all recognize that. What a privilege to have him cross our paths. And what a privilege I've had in bringing him each day a little message from the book and discussing it together and then praying and meeting with our Lord on the basis of the blood shedding of Calvary and the imputed righteousness of God's Son to our heart. He asked me to remember him to you all tonight. I usually go at 11 o'clock in the morning to see him, but this afternoon I have to go uh, this afternoon because of the morning commitment of the service. He was in great form tonight. We had a great time together around the Word of God. And he is praying for me now as I stand before you, and that is a great sense of encouragement for me. Do remember to pray for us. We have our backs against the wall in our country at the present time. For the first time, the British government has commanded of us that we must sit down with armed, gun with armed gangsters and gunmen who possess guns that they will not give up who possess the power to kill and maim, that they will not stop. And we are supposed to negotiate with them as if they were Democrats and as if they had a right and a mandate to sit at the negotiating table. Well, I don't sit down with unrepenting murderers. I don't do business with them. I'm outside the talk. Although my party was the second party in the election, the second largest party, I beat Sinn Féin, I beat Mr. Hume's Nationalist Party, and I, we were the second largest party in the country. But you cannot sell your birthright and sit down with those whose main intention is to kill and destroy and maim and destroy any vestige of democracy. So we are spending our time in another way of battle, the power of prayer. And God in these last days 
has been blowing the lid of this whole filthy business. Every day there are more leaks. Every day there's more crises. Every day somebody else is found out with lies. Every day God is pulling the filthy smoke screen away. And people are beginning to see who's right in these matters. God always defends the right. For a time, truth may be kicked in the gutter, but at the end of the day, truth will take the throne and the lie will be buried in ignominy and shame. So do pray for us that the Lord will keep us true to himself and strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We're reading in the Word of God tonight uh, from the 8th chapter of Jeremiah. I didn't say to you, did I, that we're reading in the authorized version of the English Bible. The eighth chapter of Jeremiah. At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved and whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered, nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. And death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family which remain in all places, whether I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away? and not return. Why then is this people of Jerusalem sitting back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they speak not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turneth to his course as the horse rusheth into the battle. Yea, the star in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the cream and the swallow Observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. How do ye say we are wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Though they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them. Therefore will I give their wives unto others, and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least, even unto the greatest, is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest, every one 
dealeth falsely. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade. And the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves. Let us enter into the defense cities. Let us be silent there. The Lord our God hath put us to silence, and given us water of gall to drink, because we have sinned against the Lord. We looked for peace, but no good came. For a time of health, and behold, trouble, the snorting of his horses, was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of the strong ones. For they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. For behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which shall not, will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country, is not the Lord in Zion is not her king in her. Why have they provoked me to anger with graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved, for the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black, astonishment hath taken hold on me. Is there no Bam in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recover, and God shall send with his own divine seal of approval this reading from his very own infallible book. Amen and amen. Let's stand for a prayer before the preaching. Father, pour out thy Holy Spirit upon us now, for Jesus' sake. Father, pour out thy Holy Spirit powerfully upon us now, for Jesus' sake. Father, pour out thy Holy Spirit more powerfully upon us now, for Jesus' sake. Father, pour out thy Holy Spirit still more powerfully upon us now, for Jesus' sake, give us the hush of heaven in this meeting. Give us the recognition and realization 
and the intensification of thy holy and sacred presence. Lord Jesus, come down this aisle tonight. Sit beside every hearer. Stand at my elbow in this pulpit. And may this house be filled with the stillness of thy presence. The Lord was not in the fire. The Lord was not in the earthquake. The Lord was not in the wind. But the Lord was in the still, small voice. May that still, small voice be heard tonight to the salvation of immortal souls. May that still small voice be heard this night to the restoration of backsliders. May that still small voice be heard tonight in the reviving of the people of God. And to this end I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost, I take. Thank God he undertakes for me. And the people of God said, Amen. You may be seated. The twentieth verse of the eighth chapter of Jeremiah's prophecy. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not seen. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not You will notice there are three things in this text. We have, first of all, the passing of opportunity. The harvest is past. Secondly, we have the passage to eternity, the summer is ended. And lastly, we have the plea of tragedy. We are not seeing. I was thinking that that plea of tragedy, no matter in what circumstances, it falls from the lips of humanity. It always has agony and tragedy in its prompting. We are not seeing. It may be the tragedy of inevitable doom when an aeroplane loses control and is dashed down from the clouds to the earth. And as it gains its momentum to its final crash, those aboard cry out, We are not seeing! Those faced with inevitable doom. The same would be true of the vehicle when it leaves the road. The same would be true when the ship drifts from anchorage to doom. Inevitable calamity, disaster, and the cry goes up from souls as they face the catastrophe. We are not seeing it. It's a plea of tragedy. 
or the circumstances may be different. It may be the facing of inevitable death. The man is in the sick chamber. The blinds are drawn. The medical men have made their examination and they have withdrawn. The man is waiting for a sentence. He hears the whispers outside the chamber. He hears the talk. And then eventually, when the medical man returned, he knows that the look on their faces is one that spells for him the end. And as they tell him the, ver the verdict, that a life-ending sickness or disease has taken over. He whispers, I am not seeing it. That's a plea of tragedy. But what shall I say about the person that has come under the influence of the divine and blessed Spirit of God? who has sat under the preaching of the doctrines of free and sovereign grace, who has been brought by the proclamation of the same to the cross, and has viewed the suffering and the bleeding and the passion and the agony of the substitute, our Lord Jesus Christ. But time after time, has turned away from the free and glorious offer of Christ, has trampled underfoot the blood of the everlasting covenant and treated it an unholy thing, has said no to the tender entreaties of the Holy Spirit, and has turned his back upon the only way of salvation, in Christ alone. And then comes a time when that person must also go out into the great, untracked, untrodden eternity. When the curtains that divide time from eternity must be parted for him or for her. And as a soul unprepared, uncleansed, unregenerated, unsaved, and unrepenting. Here's the summons to go down that dark passageway and to go out into the black night of a lost eternity. And that soul cries out, in its last gasp and time, I am not seeing. That's the most tragic picture of all. We're not dealing in this text with physical tragedies or national tragedies or the tragedies that come to man and woman in all the walks of life. But we're dealing with the tragedy of a lost soul. The tragedy of a soul that's venturing out into the great darkness of everlasting damnation. I am not seeing. I wonder how many in this house of God tonight, sitting in this solemn gospel service, have to honestly say, I am not saved. Is that what you have to say tonight as you sit in this house of God? I am not saved. I am not saved from sin. I love it still. Is that your confession? I am not saved from sinful ways. 
and sinful thoughts and sinful actions. Is that what you have to confess? I am not saved, although I have heard the gospel. Is that what you have to confess? I am not saved, though my father and mother has pled with me to accept their Savior and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. My parents are children of God, but I am not saved. My brothers and sisters and friends and relations are in the kingdom of God, but I am not saved. Is that what you have to confess tonight? I have been baptized. But I am not saved. How many baptized sinners are there in the church today on the road to a never-ending hell because a blood mark is not in their heart? The only thing that God's looking for in our hearts is the mark of His Son's blood. When I... See the blood. I will pass over you. I have sat at the Lord's table, but I am not seen. Is there, is there someone here this night, and you have to confess that, that you have actually taken of the elements from the table of the Lord, the bread that represents and is a symbol of his broken body. The cup and wine, which is a symbol of the New Testament, of his redeeming blood. And you have ate, and you have drank with uncleansed lips, an uncircumcised heart, at that table prepared only for the same. And by so doing, you have ate and drank damnation to your own soul, not discerning the Lord's body. The night as you sit in this service, you have to admit it. I have taken of the emblems of the Lord's Supper, but I am not seeing. I have sat in gospel meetings where I knew that God was working. And I felt that hand greater than eternity upon my soul. And I knew that the Spirit of God was dealing with me. And men and women around me came to Christ. And I saw their lives changed and their ways changed. And their lips changed, and their behavior changed. But I am not saved. I have forgotten how many times the Spirit of God has so spoken to me, but I am not saved. I cannot now count out, count up, the many times I have felt the nail-pierced hand knocking at my heart's door. But I am not saved. Have you to confess that? Dear sinner friend, this is a plea of awful tragedy. No words of mine can describe the tragedy of a soul that has been preached to the gate of heaven and yet has gone to hell. Did you ever think of Judas? He kissed the door of heaven, the Lord Jesus, when he went to hell. You have been brought to the very door of heaven. Earnest and fervent prayers have surrounded the throne of grace for you. Perhaps in this meeting 
There's some man, some woman, some boy or girl can say, I have been at death's door. I was almost in eternity, yet I am not saved. God dealt with me, broke my body that he might break my soul. And yet when I recovered, I put away his claims. I rejected his sweet and holy invitation, and I went on careless and indifferent to his wooings. Have you to say that? God in mercy has delivered you. Every one of God's saints can say, as the old hymn writer wrote, Preserve me when my feet made haste to hell. And there I would have gone, but thou hast done all things well. Thy grace was great, thy blood was free, that from hell's pit delivered me. Oh yes, you are here tonight in healthy body, with a sound mind, and sound in life and limb, and yet you are not saved, and you have never faced up to the fact that the harvest is passing, and the summer is ending, and you are not. I think of two incidents that come to my mind from my early ministry. When I went to the Ravenhill Road some fifty-one and a half years ago to preach the gospel, I wanted to be at my best for Jesus Christ. And I remember saying... Uh, to my elders, after I had been ordained and settled, who is the worst man on this road? And they looked at me, and they smiled one to another, and they said, he's just a young preacher. He's overzealous, but he'll learn. But I persisted, and eventually they said, there's a man who lives in a hovel across the road from the church. The first time he was caught drunk, he was a child of twelve. And he has lived that way ever since. And if you want to see him, go down to the local public house at ten o'clock any night, and you'll see him thrown out. And he'll crawl up the road, and he'll go through the little alleyway, And he'll go and lie in a bed of straw. I suppose we might say he's the worst sinner on the road and has lived like that for years. I said, thank you. They said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to see him converted. And if they smiled at me the first time, They smiled. Now, these were good men. Some of them had been saved from the very depths of sin themselves. But they had become respectable. They had become respectable in their churchianity. They had lost the old fire. They had lost the old way of praying. The old way of witnessing. The old way of seeking after souls. The old way of reproach. So I prayed. And this man came to church, and they were all surprised. They thought it was a most wonderful thing. But how could it be wonderful when the preacher was praying a very long time before the man came to church? So he came. I was a foolish young preacher, and I said, well, I've got him in. Now I'm going to fire the gospel gun at him every Sunday night. So I did take my gospel gun and I fixed it with the hottest powder I knew and the hardest bullets I knew. And every night as he sat over 
on my left hand side. I fired my gospel gun at him. It didn't seem to take any effect at all. And then one night I said, I must get home to this man. So I'll preach on the curse of booze. And I went into that pulpit like a madman. And I denounced liquor in the language that Billy Sunday denounced liquor. I went for the liquor traffic. The hell-soaked business that it is. And he sat smiling. And you know what he said to me as he left the meeting? He shook me by hand. And he said, this drink's an awful curse, isn't it, Mr. Paisley? You preached a great sermon. And he was smelling like a distillery as he said it to me. But there was one thing I didn't do. I didn't give up praying. For in a case like that, except there's prayer, the preaching has no power. One day I received a message. Uh, from his daughter. She said, the old man is ill. He needs to see you. I said, I'll come right away. Now oh, my old church was surrounded with red brick terrace houses, hundreds of them. The people that lived in them were all shipyard workers. They worked in the Queen's Island, our great shipyard. At the height of that island, there was 25,000 men worked there. Today there's only 3,000. So the whole district has changed. But every house was kept like a palace. And in front of every house, there was what we called the half moon. You wouldn't know anything about that. But that was where the woman scrubbed the pavement in front of their house. And she scrubbed it, and there was a half moon. You could have taken your breakfast of that part of the pavement. Every house was clean. And although they were poor, working class people, just after the hungry thirties that we had in our country, when things were very bad economically, the good room of the house was always a perfect room was like a palace. And you said to me, I brought a bed down. I have him in the good room. So she showed me into the good room. And there was a bed. And this man was in the bed. You couldn't have seen him. All I could see was his nose. He had the blankets up round him and the sheets round him and a pillow over the top part of his face. So I went in and I heard his voice. He said, Shut the door. I don't want her to hear anything. So I shut the door. I pulled my chair forward to the bed. I said, maybe you'd take the pillow off your head and pull down the blankets. I could see you. He says, I'll do that. So he did that. I said, I hear you're sick. He says, I'm not sick. Well, I said, what are you doing in bed? And he burst into tears. He said, I'm a lost soul. I'm a damned soul. There's no hope for me, Mr. Paisley. I'm lost. But he said, I thought if I could get you here, I could get hope. But I knew I had to dis disillusion him of that. So I said, well, you've sent for the wrong person. Because I can't bring you any hope. You know, I'm not a Roman priest. And I said, there's a lot of Protestants today. And to think if they get a Protestant minister to the bedside, they're going to get hope. But there's no hope in a Protestant minister. And he cried. Big tears ran down his hardened face. He said, what will I do? I said, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to meet Jesus. I didn't tell him what had been taught me in theology. I told him this simple story that I myself had learned at my mother's knee that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And heaven touched earth that day 
And that man, the worst sinner on the Raven Hill Road, a drunkard from the age of twelve, got gloriously redeemed by the Savior's blood. And he lived to prove it. It's coming up near Christmas, and this drunken, drunken friend says he'll never make Christmas. He'll be drunk before Christmas Day, but he got past Christmas. And then they said he would never make the 12th of July, which is a big marching day in our country, and a lot of drink flows. He made the 12th of July. And then they said he would never make Black Saturday, which is another marching day, and a lot of drink flows, and he made Black Saturday. And then they gave him up. They admitted that something had happened to him. Of course, something had happened. Jesus had come in. He never went back to the liquor. He's in heaven tonight. I remember the last night day I was with him, and we talked about the day when we would meet at the gate of heaven. And he would welcome me home. He was an old man when I led him to the Lord. I was only a young fellow of 21. That's a many years ago. But tonight I thank God that that poor man recognized that he was not saved. And although the harvest was passing and the summer was ending, he still could find peace and joy and pardon in Jesus Christ. But let me paint to you another picture. One day I was sent to look for to another home. I was surprised that I was invited to this home because the man who lived there was a very bitter enemy of mine. He hated me with a great hatred. He was a police officer. He had served in the Royal Irish Constabulary before Ireland was divided, and he had served in the Royal Ulster Constabulary when the division came in the early 20s. He was a hard man. He was a bitter man. And he was a wicked man. And when I arrived at his home, his wife, through her tears, she said, Mr. Paisley, thank you for coming. But I'm afraid it's too late. I said, what do you mean? She said, well... I would have liked you to have come earlier, but I was afraid if you came, he might have had a fit of anger, and he might have died in that fit. But I said, is he unconscious? She said, yes, partly, but sometimes he's not. But I said, what can I do with a person that's unconscious? It is too late. I couldn't even get the gospel over to him. I went into the room and two of his companions, police officers, were there. And every now and again, the body of that man would shake and the whole bed shook. And then he would try to get up. And one of those police officers had to sit in his feet and the other on his shoulders to keep him down. And he would use the vilest curses that ever came from the mouth of a sinner. And then he would start crying, crying for mercy, yelling to God Almighty not to damn him. I knelt down, I tried to pray, but my prayer was like a boomerang. It came back and hit me upon my head. That man was beyond the peel. Not long afterwards, he gave a gasp. And he had gone down into the darkness of eternity. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. 
I wonder in the final reckoning, what picture will you be in? Saved by grace through the mercy of God. Or lost because you've trifled once too often with the Holy Spirit. Pushed away the nail-pierced hand of the Son of God and willfully and deliberately gone out into the darkness of eternity. Eternity! Eternity! Where, men and women, will you be in eternity? That's the question that you've got to answer tonight. In this text, as I have said, there is a passing of opportunity. The harvest is past. Opportunities come and go. Opportunities to be saved, to repent, to believe the gospel, to turn and receive the Savior. But in the passage, the solemn passage I have read, the passing of opportunity passed and there was no returning. In verse 5, there was no repentance in verse 6, and there was no realization of the plight in verse 7. Is that how your opportunities have been passing? Opportunities to be saved. Opportunities to get right with God. Opportunities to start for heaven and to be in time. But there's something more in my text. The summer is ended. The passage to eternity. And that passage to eternity in verse 6, it's the passage of rushing. Rushing to eternity. Everyone turneth to his course as the horse rusheth into the battle. Think of it. Sin has so got the hold of you tonight. Sin has so gripped you. Sin has so captivated you. Sin has so harnessed you that you're rushing to the end of the summer, and the end of the summer is the passage to eternity for you. And then you will notice in verse 11 and 12, there is nothing but reprobacy. The man, the woman becomes a reprobate. They have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there's no peace. There's the voice of a reprobate who pretends there's peace when there's no peace. Don't you let the devil create in your heart, sinner, a counterfeit peace. For Jesus Christ said, when the strong man armed keepeth his house, his goods are at peace. That's the devil's peace. And what a tragedy it is when men mistake the devil's peace from God's peace. What a state of deception their hearts are in. And then in verse 12, there's no shame, no blushing. Can you walk out of this meeting? Rejecting Christ without a blush. Can you walk out of this meeting trampling underfoot the blood of the everlasting covenant? And it never calls you even to stop and consider that you're crucifying afresh to yourself the Son of God and putting Him to an open shame. Oh, how terrible 
the state of a soul in a state of reprobacy before God. And then final rejection. They have rejected the word of the Lord and what wisdom is in them. Men and women, I would plead with you tonight. Turn while the Spirit in mercy is pleading and steer for the harbor bright. For how do you know that your soul may be drifting over the deadline tonight.